your wisdom and revelation so that your holy word bears fruit in our spirit and in our soul. We receive it and we thank you for it. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. How I love Jesus because he first loved me. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. Oh. sermon, you will leave here better spiritually with a greater understanding that you had before you came. Do you remember that? Amen. 
And God is keeping us in the Psalms for a while. I don't know how much longer. It may be another sermon or two. But this word that he has given to us for our hearing today is also to improve our understanding about the times we live in and who we are and who he is to us. Go with me, if you will, to Psalm 90, 90, the 90th Psalm. Now, if, if you would like to stand, that's wonderful. If you would prefer to sit, that's entirely up to you because I'm going to be reading all 17 verses because they're meaningful. Beginning with verse 1, Psalm 90. Hear the word of God. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thou turnest man to destruction, and sayest, Return, ye children of men. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Thou carriest them away as with a flood. They are like asleep in the morning. They are like grass which groweth up. In the morning it flourishes, and grows up in the evening it is cut down and withers for we are consumed by thine anger and by thy wrath are we troubled thou hast set our iniquities before thee our secret sins in the light of thy countenance for all our days are passed away in thy wrath we spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of of thine anger. Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? And let it repent thee concerning thy servants. O oh, satisfy us early with thy mercy that we may rejoice and be glad all our days make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us and the years wherein we have seen evil let thy work appear unto thy servants and thy glory unto their children and let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands. Establish thou it. Our thought today. Lord God, establish the work of our hands. Lord God. Establish the work of our hands. Moses is the writer of this song. 
Moses here as the servant of God is in this prayer by which he calls upon God in the form of a psalm. A psalm is a, a specific, a, a, a melodic, poetic cadence. And Moses calls upon God in a psalm with a specific prayer of intercession. Kind of like, I love the Lord. He heard my cry. We're not the first ones who did that. Moses here is communicating with God about several things. For instance, in verse 1, Moses is acknowledging God as being the very God in whom every generation of Israel has lived. To live in God is very important. And in verse 2, Moses also acknowledges here that God is eternal and that God is the creator of the earth upon which we live. Let, 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 let me go back and read that for you just to make sure we're right. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Moses is saying, ever since Israel has been alive, we have had the fortune and the blessing of dwelling in you. In every generation. And then in verse 2, he says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. He's saying, God, you are eternal. We have not been around as long as you, because you are eternal. But you have blessed us so that ever since we've been around, we've been able to get in you. Every generation. God keeps a remnant. Even when the masses of the generation, when the, the larger body of the generation falls apart and gets caught up into drugs and gets caught up into crime and gets caught up into all kind of other things, some of them traps laid for us and others we just choose to go into ourselves. But ever since God has been around, a remnant of us have been able to stay in him. But then... In verses 3 through 6, Moses shows us that God only gives to us a certain dispensation of time in which we are to perform that which he has determined and assigned to us, which includes for us a preparation time so that we can accomplish and fulfill with our life all that he's got for us. So that means even now, if we have not accepted him, and there are those of us, we're still here in this, our generation, we can still begin to allow God to prepare us. Even this morning. Because it's not too late. Look at what he says in verses 3 through 6. I, I want to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm doing this right. Thou turns man to destruction and says, Return, ye children of men. In other words, he said, I'm going to make it so that it's going to be hard for you. And once it's hard for you and you begin to be beat down with the vicissitudes of life that you cannot overcome, then you will turn back to me. Verse 
verse 4, he says, For a thousand years in the sight, in thy sight, I but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Moses is saying, a whole millennium to you, God, is not even a whole night. It's just a watch in the night. A whole thousand years is just a few hours for God. But we're taking ourselves through all kind of crazy things during the course of that thousand years. Generation after generation. Is this all right? It's going to get good in a minute. We got to look at our ugliness first. Generation after generation. Because he is preparing us. But only as we give ourselves to him. He'll start getting us ready when we start reaching out to him and asking him, Lord, prepare me. We're asking him to prepare a table before us, but instead of asking him, prepare me for the table first. Is that making sense? That's what we need to be asking him. And then he goes on to say in verse 5, Thou carriest them away as with a flood. They are like a sleep in the morning. They are like grass which groweth up. So he's saying, listen, we fall apart in such ways that we don't know where we're going or where we're coming from. And we do that across entire generations. Entire gen But God always maintains a small remnant a small piece of the fabric so that with them he can begin to weave together the rest of his called people. Verse 6, he says, in the morning it flourishes, it grows up, in the evening it is cut down and withers. Talking about the grass that grows. He's, he's talking to us about the passing of time. The passing of time. And in verses 7 through 11, Moses is showing to us that God judges us. He doesn't start the intercession until later on. First, he shares with God, I know we're crazy and we're wicked and we've done all kinds of things and we don't realize what we're bringing upon ourselves. So in verses 7 through 11, Moses is showing to us that God judges us for our sinful choices that we've made and that in his judgment upon us, we will pass through this world across many generations of our kind living in disfavor and hardship. Let me read it. I, I could have misread it. Let me read. Verses 7 through 11. I'm just going to read it right through. For we are consumed by thine anger and by thy wrath are we troubled, not our own, your anger, your wrath upon us, God, because we messed up. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee. In other words, he's brought us right before him and the stuff we've done and looked at our sinful ways. Our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. So he's saying there's a whole long period of time that God is upset with us generation after generation. And God is saying, no, I'm not going to bless you. I will keep a remnant spared so that I will have a patch of fabric that I can begin to weave you back together onto. But I'm not going to spare the masses of you. People are going to hate you. They're not going to like you. They're going to set traps for you. They're going to disapprove of you. And for generations this will take place. How many of us know 
that we have been there. We have been there. When we ruled the world, the known world, we did just like every other people who came into rulership of the world. We were no better or no worse. So we've come before the Lord in judgment and over the millennia, God has kept a remnant what do you mean kept a remnant? If somebody that you know had not been saved, you would have never received a witness from that person. That person is a remnant that God kept. If somebody that in my mother's time and in her father's time, if some of those were not saved, my mother's father would have never gotten witness to. My mother would have never gotten witness to. Are you getting what we're saying here? For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. They're looking at us and saying, look at them. Who wants to be like them? Who wants to have anything else to do with them? All because we choose to not allow God to prepare us. We choose to do it. I'm not going to beat up on you. It's going to get good. Then he says in verse 10, the days of our years are threescore years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knows the power of thine anger, God? He's still talking to God. Even according to your fear, so is your wrath. Not fear like in the way we think of being afraid. But because of your awesomeness. Even your wrath can destroy us. And... We've spent so much of our time, all of us in our generation, and those before us in the earlier generations had it even worse. Living in disfavor and hardship. That's what Moses is saying here. Let's, let's be real about the scripture. And that God still will yet allow each of us to as an individual, have 70 or 80 years, he says here in the scripture. Three score plus 10 is 70 years. And even four score, 80 years to live. If we start getting it together, but it'll still be a laborious time of work and suffering and toil. So, with our personal time here, we need to be concerning ourselves with giving ourselves to God, submission, so that he can prepare us. I mean, in 2013, right now, we need to be giving ourselves to God so that he can prepare us and get us ready so that we can begin to receive breakthrough in our lives. He wants us to do well, but he will not go against his righteousness just so that we can do well. He requires of us that we be righteous. And then in verses 12 through 17, we can almost Hear Moses' voice as he begins his intercessory ministry to God on behalf of his own generation. 
who were then present and alive upon this earth when he was living, when Moses was living, and, 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 and look and listen at what Moses was actually asking of God. Now he begins to cry out to God for the people. So teach us. We know we've messed up in former generations. Teach us to count our days to realize we don't have as long as we would like to have. Teach us to number our days so that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Teach us to realize and count up the fact that we don't have a whole lot of time here. Help us to get to the point where we really pay attention to your wisdom. Then in verse 13, he says, Return, O Lord, how long? And let it repent thee concerning thy servants. He's saying, Lord, be patient with us. Change your mind about us, please. Repent about what we've done. And we know you want to pass judgment on us right now. But please have mercy upon us for what we've done. And help us to change. Is anybody getting this? Help us. We want to change. But even when you were giving me your commandments in the wilderness, we were using gold to make idols. Help us to change. Change your mind about punishing us and wiping us off the face of the earth. Then, in verse 14, he says, Oh, Satisfy us early. Don't make us wait much longer, Lord. I don't know if we can take it. I believe that's what Moses was saying. Because even though you've set us free from bondage, we're out here in the wilderness and we're crazy. Let me put that another way. Even though the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, in 1865, still, we're out here acting crazy. And he goes on, and he says, Satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. In other words, Moses said, we know we deserve punishment for what we've done and what we've been like, but have mercy on us so that our soul will be able to rejoice in thy mercy. Have mercy on us for this little while that we'll be here. Have mercy on us. Everyone, as I look out here among you and, and, and at myself, none of us in this sanctuary right now are children. None of us. Every one of us are full grown. Some of us full growner than others. So none of us have a whole lot of time left. We don't know exactly how much time it is, but we ought to be wanting God's mercy for the time that we've got left so that we can rejoice in gladness in our heart and find out, God, what is it that you want me to do? And help me to do it. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us. In other words, for as long as you punished us and afflicted us, make us happy about that. So that now we'll understand how to go right, how to go straight, how to do it the way you want it done, how to live our lives in such a way that it glorifies you. Lord, establish the work of our hands. Help us to know. Then in verse 16, 
let thy work appear unto thy servants. He said, give us revelation. Give us revelation. Let your work appear unto your servants. And thy glory, we're going to talk about that glory later. Pay attention. Unto thy children. He said, let us see your glory. Not after we leave here. Not when we come to be with you. And if we keep going like we're going, we won't come to be with you. But let us see your glory now. Let us see it. And let the beauty of the Lord, our God, be upon us. Establish thou the works of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands, establish thou it. He said, Lord, tell us what you want us to do. Help us to become prepared so that you can bring us to fulfill everything that you've put us here to fulfill. Moses was saying, we don't want to live like this anymore. We don't want to live like this anymore. And now, in our dispensation, Christ has already come. The Son of the living God has come down to us in our dispensation. Not in our generation, but in the fullness of the time of our generations, Christ has come. And there is now no man or woman who has to wander, lost, stumbling and falling through life. Our destiny is set for each of us. All that is left for each of us to do is only to receive Christ through the Holy Spirit that he has ascended and sent down to us here in this world so that he, God himself, will establish the work of our hands. After a period of preparation, God will establish. We're still in the age of Pisces. The age it was when Christ came into this world. We're still in the age of Pisces, right? At the end of it, we're moving into the age of Aquarius, brotherhood and, and, and sweetness. We're moving into that. God numbers the ages. Listen. He's the God of eternity, and he established time. I believe your Bible reads like mine in Genesis, where he put the sun up to rule the day and the moon to rule the night. That tells us he established time. Moses, in his lifetime, Moses represented a period of preparation. After him came Joshua, and he represented a period of breakthrough and manifestation. Moses was the one that God said, Lead them out of bondage. And then they had to get in the wilderness for 40 years so that God could purge them of their craziness. Are you telling me that he's been purging us since 1865? That's a little longer than 40 years. Are we that Stubborn? Boy, does that show how merciful he is. Mm. We must not concern ourselves so much with becoming someone in this world. 
but rather we must place ourselves in the care of God in such a way so as that he will manifest us as being in him. We're so busy becoming that we won't allow God to bring us into being. How about if we stop becoming, how about if we stop trying to manifest ourselves? Let me put it that way. And get in God and let him become manifest in us and then manifest us to become who it is that he has created us to be. Christ has come. And he has already done the work that Moses teaches us to prepare ourselves for. You're going to leave here better. Do we get it? Christ had not come when they were in the wilderness. So they couldn't get it the way we can get it. Christ has already come. And he has already done all the work, all of it, that Moses teaches us here in this psalm that we have to prepare ourselves for. Our work became completed in Christ. And now all we have to do in order to um, accomplish it, what he has already finished for us, is to get in him. And we won't even do that. Is this all right, Pastor? We have to get in him. Otherwise, the evil, wicked generation that we are alive in will continue to beat us down and set traps for us and hold us under and plot our destruction. Get in him. The work is finished. And now once we each make up our mind to receive Christ, he then establishes the work in us. We now have this advantage that Israel of the Old Testament did not have. We have the ascended Christ who came and overcame the world and ascended so that if we get in him, then what he has intended us to do becomes doable in us. In other words, now don't become doable, becomes done in us. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. Moses didn't have that. Jesus, the son of God. Let us continue forward by our profession of faith. For our high priest is not a high priest who does not feel and relate to our personal individual struggles. For he came and himself experienced the same kind of struggles. But he, what he did was rose above those struggles by resisting their temptings. And because of this victory that he achieved, he overcame these struggles for us. And so we should be bold and not timid or afraid to come before him at his very throne. Why do we come before him at his throne? So that he will meet every need 
that we may have. That's Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. The EA version. Earl authorized. These are God's advantages for us. That the chosen children of the Old Testament did not have. They did not have it. The Holy Spirit had not yet come into this world in order to rescue man. Old Testament Israel could not enjoy the benefits of experiencing personally a one-to-one -one relationship with God. And in light of this, we today should be asking God about a more timely revelation into our present generation about some of his New Testament scriptures that our fathers and their fathers did not receive from God in the earlier generations of their own times. Say that again, Pastor Roberts. Our generation today, my father went to be with the Lord a few years ago. He was 95. Our generation present today should be asking God for a relevant and timely revelation to us that my father did not get in his time. God is eternal. He is living, alive, and his word is sharper than any two-edged sword. Why does he go generation after generation after generation? Because in each generation, he has something that he wants to reveal. But if we're stuck in our own selves. We'll miss it. We will miss it. The earlier generations, there was a remnant of us in which he revealed himself. And that remnant in which he revealed himself was good for 50 years ago, for 100 years ago, for 200 years ago. But we live in a different kind of civilization than they did. Is this making sense? We live in a different kind of civilization, a different kind of world culture. Planes and jets are flying all over the place. The internet is taking the word around the world as quick as you can bat your eye almost. So we need a right now revelation from God. That's what God is requiring us. We need a right now Revelation from him. So we should be asking him, Lord God, establish the work of our hands. Tell us what it is you want us to do. Show us how to do it. Strengthen us so that we can accomplish it. <laughs> Scriptures like 1 John 3, 2, where in times past we we read it, we thought it meant we would become changed and glorified with Christ when we die. We need a higher revelation than that now. Is this making sense? We, if we're going to transform a generation, then we need a revelation from God. We thought 1 John 3, 2 meant we will become changed and glorified with Christ when we die. While that is true, how it is going to glorify us for this present work that he has for us to do while yet we live in this world. How 
is that word there in 1 John 3, 2 going to bless us now? Look at what it says. Beloved, now are we the children of God. Not after we leave here. Now are we the children of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, doesn't mean when he comes back for his church. It means when we allow him to reveal himself to us now. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. How are we going to look like him? No, it doesn't say we're going to look like him. We will be as he is. For we shall see him as he is. In other words, when he reveals himself to us now, we become his children. We've been chosen. We've been called, but we haven't been chosen yet because we haven't submitted ourselves to him. And God is ready to give us that revelation now. We are the children of God now. So we need, in other words, this generation. So we need a revelation that applies to this generation. What worked 40 years ago won't work now. David said, I have been young and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor their seed, nor their children, nor the generations after them begging for bread. Why? Because they received a revelation. And now we, after Christ has come, died, ascended, sent back the Holy Spirit, we have the power in us from God to do the work that brings the revelation to pass. We must each want the Lord to reveal himself to us and in us. And we must want it now. The Apostle Paul said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, For now we see in a mirror darkly, but then face to face. Not after we die. We need a higher revelation than that. But then face to face, when face to face, when we surrender ourselves to God, when we allow him to reveal himself to us, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then once I've sent my, uh, surrendered myself to him, then shall I know even as also I am known. When I surrender myself to him, he completely knows me. He knows me anyway. That's why he won't reveal himself to me until I surrender. Once I surrender, he knows that I've surrendered all of it now. So he opens up and reveals himself to me and pours himself into me and I become like him and so do you. Not only that, we will know him then even as he knows us. This is the new revelation that we want. This is the timely revelation that we want for this generation in which we live. It was good for Paul and Silas and it's good enough for me. No, it's not! It was good for my dear mother, so it's good enough for me. No, it is not! They lived in different times. If Paul and Silas had seen a jet plane, they would have probably went crazy. Do I need to stop? I'm almost done. Seeing them. That we have such hope, 2 Corinthians 3, verses 12 through 18. 
Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. This is EA version. Great, you can read, you can follow along with me in, in the scripture. Put them up on the screen. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, who put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remains the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. So since Christ has already come, the veil has been torn. So why are we not entering the Holy of Holies? He goes on to say, still in that same passage, but even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Did you get that? Even unto this same day, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Only after Christ came was the veil taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, you are free to go in whenever you want to. I don't remember hearing anybody say, I'm going in, I'm going in. He goes on, and I'm going to finish. But we all with unveiled face, because of Christ, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. In other words, we're seeing him just like we're looking in a mirror. We can't touch him, but we see just a, a, enough of an image to know he's with us. Is anybody in here? And we are changed into the same image as Christ from glory to glory. Even as by the Spirit of the Lord. In the Old Testament in Moses' time, they did not have that. Goes. Yes. In this physical world we are more concerned with the political and governing ourselves for material benefit than with faith and things that are spiritual and being submitted to the governing of God for eternal purposes we should always be crying out to God Lord establish the work of our hands. We should always be crying out to him. And in the course of crying out, we should be surrendering to him, saying, Lord, have your way with us. Do what you will with us. Lord, we know we've not always been perfect. Lord, we know that there were times in our life where you just became completely fed up with us. But right now, Lord, we want you to have your own way. Oh, Lord. <laughs> right now, Lord, teach us to become the people that you want us to become. We surrender, Lord. We give in, Lord. We bow down, Lord. Not my will. But thy will be done. Oh, yes. Teach us, Lord. Establish us. Make us to become the ones you've created us to be. In this generation, show us enough of your image. We know you won't see you in the flesh. 
But show us enough of your image in our spirit so that we'll know that you're with us. You're healing us. You're delivering us. You're setting us free from the bondage of this world. Help us, Lord. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, Lord. I want to be there in that day. But before I get there, I want to see him now. I want to see him here. And when all the troubles are around me, the troubles of this world, I want him to take me by the hand and say, oh, it's all right. You don't have to worry. I got you, Earl. I'll hold you up, Earl. I'll keep you, Earl. I'll protect you, Earl. Don't worry about the traps and snares. You're going to make it over, but you've got a job to do. Too many of us just want to make it over, and we don't want to do the work. We need to be asking the Lord, establish us in your work right now. Mm -hmm. oh, Lord. That's what we need to be. That's what we need to be asking. Mm -hmm. I'm too close to my journey's end. I'm too close. To turn back into a world of sin. And I wouldn't give nothing, no, no, for my journey right now. I've just got to make it to heaven somehow. I'm too close. I can almost see his face. I'm too close. And I love this old race. Hallelujah. I'm too close to heaven. And I can't turn around. I promised the Lord I would not turn around. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless you, Jesus. If you're here and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you, you, you've heard the greatness of who you are in getting to know Christ.